Welcome back. Today I'd like to talk to you about sequences and we're kind of changing gears now in the class. Uh, the first kind of half of the course in Calculus 2 covers integration and applications of integration and now we're going to switch gears into sequences and series. And so first let's just start with some basic definitions of a sequence. And first of all, the way that we typically write a sequence is something like A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on, uh, where the A's are just numbers. And uh, so just some list of numbers that has some order to it is what we call a sequence. Uh, the number A1 we call the first term of the sequence. So this is the first term of the sequence the second term of the sequence, the third term of the sequence, and so on. Um, and also, another way of thinking about a sequence is that a sequence is a function, okay? And that's going to be really important for us as we move on, thinking of a sequence as a function. And it's a function that takes the set of positive integers, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, to a1, A2, A3. And so a way to think about this, if I were to draw a picture, is I have my integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And each of those is mapped by a function to a number. And then <clears throat> the number that 1 gets mapped to is A1. The number that 2 gets mapped to is A2. 3 gets mapped to A3. 4 gets mapped to A4 and so on. And so this is the way that we can think of a sequence of numbers as a function that maps what we call the natural numbers or the counting numbers to the sequence values. Okay, uh, there are lots of sequences. I could write lots and lots of them down and you'll get a uh, chance in your homework to experiment with some of these sequences, but let's just look at one, and this is a very famous sequence. Uh, it goes 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. And maybe some of you recognize this sequence. This sequence is called the Fibonacci sequence, okay? And the way that the Fibonacci sequence is formed is the first two numbers are ones, and then the third number is the sum of the first two. The fourth number is the sum of 1 and 2, 5 is the sum of 2 and 3, 8 is the sum of 3 and 5, and so on. Okay, so this is just an example of a sequence that's kind of a famous sequence. Let's look at a definition. Um, <clears throat> this definition says, if the sequence a sub n, and now I should make a note of something, and notice that I have these little curly braces on this a sub n. And what the curly braces mean is I'm referring to the entire sequence now, not just the nth term of the sequence. So if the curly braces weren't there and I just said a sub n, that's the nth term of the sequence. But if I put the curly braces around the a sub n, that means the entire sequence written out uh, full length every term of the sequence. So if this sequence a sub n converges to L, we write, and what I mean by converges to L is, as the n's get bigger and bigger, are we getting close to something? And if we're getting close to something, then we might say that it converges, okay? So as the n's get big, are these values getting close to some number? And if they are, we say it converges, and we say that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to L. Another way of writing that is sometimes we'll just say that the a sub n's go to L. And L is called the limit of the sequence, okay? So if we have this infinite list of numbers, a question we can ask is, does that infinite list of numbers actually get close to something? Or is it not getting close to something? So if it gets close to something, then we say that it converges to that number. And uh, we call that number the limit of the sequence. OK, having said that, let's look at this theorem. OK, the theorem tells us that if we have two different sequences, the sequence of a sub n's and the sequence of b sub n's, 
uh, and we have two real numbers, capital A and capital B, then if the limit of the A sub n's is capital A, and the limit of the B sub n's is capital B, then we have these five rules. And really, we've seen these five rules before in Calculus 1. These are just my nice limit rules. Okay, but what this is saying is that the limit rules work for sequences as well as they work for functions. Maybe that shouldn't be super surprising to us since we just said that sequences were functions in some sense, but it is a little bit different. But everything that we kind of know and love from the past still works here. Notice that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus b sub n is just a plus b. In other words, I can distribute the limit across the sum. Similar for differences, I can distribute the limit. Similar for products, I can take the limit of the a sub n's and the limit of the b sub n's and just multiply them. Similar for constant multiples, I could pull the constant outside the limit. And similar for a quotient of two sequences, I can take the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom, provided that the limit of the bottom doesn't end up being zero. Okay, so <clears throat> this theorem is important because it tells us all the ways that we know about working with limits from calculus one, they work on sequences as well. So we can go ahead and use all of our knowledge about limits from functions, uh, continuous functions, to work on these sequences. Now I want to share with you six important limits that you really should know when you get into this whole chapter on sequences and series. So let's go through these six limits and these limits just keep coming up again and again and uh, some of these limits if you were actually to compute them yourselves you'd have to use L'Hopital's rule to do so. Uh, so let's go through them one by one and just look at what you get. The first one is that the limit as n goes to infinity of ln of n divided by n equals zero. Okay, And this is one where if you actually plugged in infinity for n, so to speak, you'd get an indeterminate form, so you'd need L'Hopital's rule to find that limit. Second one is that the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of n is equal to 1. Also one where you have n to the 1 over n power. If you wanted to take this limit, you'd need to set it equal to L, take the natural log of both sides, and eventually probably use L'Hopital's rule to get your answer. Third is that the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the 1 over n equals 1 if x is any positive number. In other words, if you raise any number to a very, very small power, it goes to 1. Okay, and if you think about that for a second, that when you take like the square root of a number, it gets closer to 1, right, if it's a positive number whether it's less than one or greater than one, it'll always get closer to one, okay? And uh, number four is that the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n is zero if the absolute value of x is less than one. The fifth one is the limit as n goes to infinity of one plus x over n to the n is equal to e to the x. Now this one comes up a lot, and this is a good one to remember. All of these are good to remember, but this one is very interesting. Like if x were one here, and I had the limit as n goes to infinity of one plus one over n to the n, then I get that that equals e to the first, and that is, in some sense, the definition of e, is it's the limit as n goes to infinity of one plus one over n to the n. But this works for any x, so plug in negative three for x here, and we get x to the negative third, I'm sorry, e to the negative third, and so on. So this is an important limit. And sixth, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, and that is always equal to zero. Okay, so we've got all of these different limits, these six limits. Like I said, these are limits that if you know them by heart, it will just help you so much as you do your homework and work through the rest of this chapter. So I would suggest to you just memorize these six limits. If you know these, it makes life a lot easier in the future. 
Okay, so let's look at some homework type problems.